If you have a Bible tonight, turn to Revelation chapter 20. Now, before we start tonight, there are about three places you need to look at here. And the first one is Revelation chapter 20, beginning at verse 11. And read verse 11 down to the end of the chapter in Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, down to the end of the chapter, it says, uh, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat upon it, from whose, before whose face the heaven and earth fled away. There was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. Another book was opened, the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things written in the books of man according to his works. And he said, uh, The seed delivered up the dead which were in them, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they would judge every man according to his works. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. It's that simple. You're born once, you die twice. You die one time, your body dies, and out there in eternity, your soul, you lose your soul. If you're born twice, you die once. If you're born once, you die twice. Now, that's a description of what we call the last judgment of the unsaved dead, sometimes called the white throne judgment. And most people think about the judgment, that's the judgment they think about. And that, that's sometimes called, it's called the last judgment or the general judgment. And every orthodox religion in this world uh, believes in some kind of a judgment, believes that sometime, somewhere, place, somewhere, God is going to settle accounts with men. Uh, if God doesn't settle accounts with men, kick him off the throne. What kind of a God is that? What kind of a God is to run this mess and let it run the way it runs and never even it up? See? God's sensible. He says, come now, saith the Lord, that's reason. Uh, their good deeds people have done, they've never been rewarded for. You know that. You know that. You and I know the good things that people have done, they've never got any reward for it all. All they got was a kick in the back. That's all they got. Uh, folks say, well, there's no such thing as a perfect murder. Yeah, people get away with murder all the time. Uh, Simpson got away with a couple of them. And uh, it's, it's a very common thing to get away with murder, but you won't get away with it forever, if there's a judgment. Now, if there's no God to right wrong, it's just be an atheist, me first, you next, dog eat dog, and live like the rest of them live. But if there's a judgment, then you've got a problem. <laughs> Take your Bible and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 in the Old Testament. If there's accountability to God, then you've got to be careful how you live. Uh, every Jew believes that sometime, someplace, somewhere, there's going to be a final judgment where he's going to be judged. Every Orthodox Jew. Now, you may have a liberal Jew. A liberal Jew is just an unsaved Jew that's rejected his religion. But if you're an Orthodox Jew, you believe that someday, sometime, someplace, somewhere, God's going to right wrongs and fix things up. If you're a Catholic, you believe that. If you're a Protestant, you believe that. This idea you shouldn't read the Bible in the schools is nonsense. You could read a, one passage from the Old Testament every day in the school without offending one Catholic or one Protestant or one Jew or one Muslim. The Muslim except the Old Testament. Why you can't read out the Old Testament in the school, I don't know, unless you're worried about offending a Buddhist or a Hindu. You might offend them, but you wouldn't offend a Muslim. They believe in a judgment. You wouldn't offend a Jew. They believe in the judgment. You wouldn't offend a Catholic. Now, I know the Catholics and Protestants don't believe in a judgment. They're... they're Bible rejecting apostates. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about Orthodox Jews, Orthodox Protestants, Orthodox Catholics, Orthodox Muslims believe that someday, somewhere, someplace, sometime, God is going to settle his accounts with men. And if you're any kind of a Protestant or a Catholic or a Jew or a Muslim, that's what you believe. Now, you may have different terms for it, ways of figuring it out, but you believe that someday, sometime, somewhere, the, right, the wrongs are going to be righted. And that's what we call the Judeo-Christian tradition. The Judeo-Christian tradition has nothing to do with family values. That's a bunch of psychological hot air. You know what it has to do with? It has to do with it. every Jew that believes the Bible believes that someday, sometime, someplace, somewhere, he'll come up from the dead and face God and be judged by the Ten Commandments. And every Christian believes someday you'll die and come up from the dead and you'll be judged by Jesus Christ. The standard for a Christian is Jesus Christ. The standard for a Jew is the Ten Commandments. Now, Muhammad's got his. Ramadan, you know, and fasting and prayer and giving alms to the poor and all that kind of stuff. And we're not going to argue tonight about what's right or what's wrong. We're just saying this, that a, a country or a nation of people that don't believe in a resurrection and personal account to God are a bunch of wild, dangerous animals. And that's what America is today. It must be wild, dangerous animals. Because if you're not accountable, then you're not responsible for what you do. So just do as you cotton pick and please. If you want to know what's wrong with this country in a nutshell, and God knows it'll take all night to talk about half the trouble we're in, 
But if you want to know what's going on in a nutshell, it's very simple. We don't fear God. No kid is taught in the school that God knows what he's doing. You couldn't find that teaching in a public school. Does he know what you're doing? Then why can't you teach it? Because a bunch of people don't think he does know what's doing. That's why, what you're doing, see? If you don't know what you're doing, you're not accountable, then I wouldn't trust you as far as I'd kick this building. You know what you'll take care of? You'll take care of whatever's in your best interest. You won't have any, you won't have to care about what God says about it. If you don't have any God, don't have any judgment. So when you talk about Judeo Christian tradition, you're not talking just about family values and all this uh, NAA horseplay. You're talking about the fact that everybody who believes anything orthodoxly, traditionally, believes that someday God's going to settle accounts. One time a preacher wrote, uh, uh, an infidel wrote to a preacher down south. This happened way back in the 1920s somewhere. An infidel, one of those big uh, farming countries up in Nebraska someplace. And wrote the preacher a letter, and he, he never went to church, this fellow never did. He was an atheist, at least professing. And he wrote this preacher a letter, and the letter said, Preacher, I want to have you know something. He said, it's September, and he said, I work in, in the fields on Sunday, and I don't go to church on Sunday, and I don't tithe, and I don't believe in God. And here is September, and I got the biggest bank account of any farmer in this state. And the preacher wrote him back and said, God doesn't settle accounts in September. He'll sell them later. Please ask his 12 to the last two verses about this, uh, uh, this my, furthermore, to take a uh, knowledge of this, my son, I'm making many books, there's no end, and much study is awareness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the matter, whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, for God shall bring thee into judgment with every secret thing or every work, whether it be good or evil. See that thing right there? Look how that chapter begins there. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth? What are you saying? He's saying God's going to bring you to judgment. You, you say everything? Turn to Romans 3. Roman, you'll get it either testament. Either testament. There's one stand in the Old Testament, a different stand in the New Testament, but it's a, the same warning. A man that doesn't live in the light of eternity cannot be trusted because eventually he'll do what he wants to do because he wants to do it. And nothing will block him from doing it and push come to shove. From survival, it's human nature, me first, you next, all there is to it. Well, I got to tell them, I wasn't saved. I'm, thank God I'm saved. I believe in heaven, I believe in hell, I believe I'll be give account of every idol worth that's spoken. I'll give account the day of the judgment man. And I have to live my life. You see me doing something you don't understand, it's because I'm thinking about way out yonder someplace. I ain't worried about this mess here. I'm way out there someplace. Because that's what I'm going to hit. But if I wasn't, if I was an unsaved man and believe was just an atheist, didn't believe in God or heaven or hell, I'd uh, hire out a hit man from off you. I'd, I'd, I'd take contracts. <laughs> Ain't that a sweet thought for a pastor? <laughs> you say, why? Well, what's the difference? If you're dead like a dog, then no heaven, no hell. Why not make all the bucks you can make any way you can make it? Amen. Come on, amen. Come on, folks. What's the matter with you? That's what the world looks at. That's exactly how they look at it. And that's how they do it, too. That's how they do it, too. All right, now, if those past you look at, turn to Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, uh, make it 2. Romans 2, 16. Somebody back here at the back, stand up, read us real loud. One of you street preachers, read us uh, Romans 2, 16. Judge what? The what of men? You ready to have your secrets judged? See? You know, Christ said, nothing is done, nothing hidden be uncovered, nothing done in secret that shall not be known. You know what Christ said? For every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give the account of their day of judgment. You know what David said? Lord, thou knowest my down sitting, thou knowest my uprising, thou understandest my thought afar off. O Lord, there is not a word in my tongue, but thou dost not know it altogether. He says in Ezekiel, the nation of Israel, thus saith the Lord, I know the things that come into your mind, every one of them. You know what David said to Solomon before David kicked the bucket and turned the kingdom over to his son Solomon? He said, you better follow the Lord because he understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. You ready to have that judged? That's what's wrong with America. They don't believe God knows what I just said. And if he does, they're in one cotton-picking mess. Now, that when you talk about those things, that ought to scare a fellow. And the fellow says, oh, you can't scare me. No, you're probably too stupid. 
I mean, he, he, he says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And some folks are so dumb, you can't scare them. A man that isn't scared under certain circumstances, not smart or brave, he's a blank idiot. I mean, people say, you can't save me with fear, Brother Ruckman. You have to, you, if you want to talk to me, you have to talk to me with love. But you can't ram it down my throat and scare me with fear. You know, you can't whip me with fear. You've got to whip me with love. Uh-huh. You know what you're like? You know, if I like fellow parked down here in the railroad back in the old days when the hummingbird used to sail up and down through here. And here come down the track at 90 miles an hour, and you're out there uh, stalled right on the track at a crossing. And you're in your car, and I say, get out, you fool, the train's coming. You say, don't talk to me in that tone of voice. I said, there's a train coming. You're going to get killed. It's going 90 miles an hour. It'll be here in less than a minute. Get out. Get out. Just don't yell at me like that. I don't like the tone of your voice. That's America. That's America. Who do you want to think you're telling me to get out of the car? I mean, who called you to take religion and ram it down my throat? When I was a boy, when I was a boy, we had a, a little song we sang. We said, a peanut man sat on the track, his harp was in a flutter, around the corner came a train, toot toot peanut butter. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what's going to be with you, brother. Toot toot peanut butter. <laughs> Listen, a man, a man that's not afraid of anything is a fool. If you get in combat, infantry combat, and you're not afraid, you're nuts. Or else you're stoned and rugs the bag, you don't know what you're doing. A good healthy fear is one of the best things you've ever had in your life. It'll keep you alive. I mean, don't go out there on the highway, you know, going interstate out there, going by there like the L.A. freeway, one of them places, 60, 65. Oh, the Autobahn be even better over there in Germany. 85, 90, 100, 120, 130. And there's a red light ahead of you. Don't say, you can't scare me. <laughs> go on through. <laughs> you crazy nuts. You better be scared. You'll be all over the highway. When they wreck over there, nobody left to file insurance, man. <laughs> <laughs> They're just glass and metal a mile and a half down the road on both sides. A man that's not afraid of anything is a fool and he's dangerous. Uh, I tell him in the prison when I preach in the prison, and I tell him in all the prisons, I don't pick any, anybody out for special treatment. I tell them all the prisons I preach in, I tell them, some of you guys are too tough for your own good. And they are. You say, why? They're not afraid of anything. A man that isn't afraid of anything is a fool. I mean, it's, uh, it's, you can see to talk big down here. I didn't talk big, you know. I mean, down here, you know, but wait till you get up there. Wait till you face him. You wait till come across him. Why, if that was Buddha up there, you think it'd bother me any? I saw a great white throne and Buddha sat upon it. I said, how you doing, you lazy bum? You seen your wife the last couple of years? <laughs> that bird, bird deserted his wife when her sat on a bow tree for about ten years, never to lick a work in his life. A lazy bum. If any man doesn't work, he's not to eat. You think he could judge me? I'd judge him before he got halfway through. Uh, do you think Muhammad gave me, me any trouble? Muhammad, are you kidding? A fellow with 14 wives left nine widows and married a nine-year-old girl when he was 52 years old? Why, that carnal, fornicating, polygamist adulterer. <laughs> you think he'd bother me? He couldn't keep me awake. But you wait till you hit somebody that never had to clear the throat. And say what I meant to say was this. Oh, he said it right the first time. Tell me some. When did he? When did he ever ask? Have to ask anybody to forgive him? For what? I mean, haven't you had to ask people to forgive you? And if you didn't, shouldn't you ask some of them? Well, he didn't have to worry about it. Uh, it well, put fear in a man. Of course, you can't scare some people. You see what you're going to try to do? Scare me tonight? Yeah, I'm going to try to scare the hell out of you. I'm going to try to do. <laughs> <laughs> You, you better be hell scared than hell scorched. <laughs> and you say, I just don't believe in fear. Sure you believe in fear. I get preached up north. These Yankees give me a hard time about this, about this fear stuff. I laugh at them. Don't kid me. Those Yankees, got, they got red cross, blue cross, double cross. They got liability. They got collision. They got fire insurance. They got life insurance. They got uh, tornado insurance. They got all Why? You know why? They're afraid. That's why. The Bible says the fear of man bringeth the snare. Don't tell me you don't tell me you don't you don't fear. You just fear the wrong thing. You know what Christ said? Christ said, Fear him is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Yea, I say to you, fear him. That's who you're supposed to fear, but you're afraid of everything else. Some of you are afraid you won't get married. <laughs> Some of you are afraid you will. <laughs> Some of you are afraid you're going to lose your job. Some of you are afraid you're going to get cancer. Some of you are afraid that the Lord is going to come back before you have a chance to get in the ministry. 
Right? Okay. <laughs> Maybe not afraid about it, but you worry about it. We've had them quit here because they caught the rapture of the so sure that it'd be futile to serve the three years. And some of them, that's been nine years ago. The thing is, you're afraid about it? I can, I can tell you in a minute what wisdom is. Whether I have it or not, I know exactly what it is. Wisdom is knowing when to be afraid. That's all there is to wisdom. Knowing when to be afraid. If you should be afraid, get scared. If you shouldn't be afraid, you ought to take an aspirin. But don't be afraid about something you shouldn't be afraid about. And don't fail to run for something that should scare you. Like flee youthful lust, see? Amen. See? Amen. See? You see what I mean? It's a matter of knowing what to fear. Now, down here, it's easy. Oh, down here, you know, they take you back to the locker room and show you a picture. I see one of these, you know? You ever try this, you know? You know, you're not a man to have this, you know? You're not a woman to you try this, you know? Big shots. I said, let's see you off him a shot. Get your brandy flask out and say, Jesus said, uh, would you like a little snort of... I, I bet you won't tell him a dirty joke. These boys are big boys down here. And you get for him, boy, you're going to see linebackers weighing 400 pounds cry and scream like babies. I'm down here, it's easy. You ever tell him one. Come up. Jesus ever hit one about the... Traveling salesman had to stay all night at the house. Campus. Hey, campus. There he is. There he is. Got him slapped in the face and spit on. You want to spit on campus? What about a campus? Where are you going, boy? <laughs> you look kind of green around the gills, man. <laughs> hey, Judas, there he is. Judas, you want to kiss him? Come on, Judas, kiss him again. Will you kiss him? So what do you mean, Judas? What are you doing? He is calling rocks, falling us, mountains, cover us in the face of the Lamb, for the day of his wrath has come, and who should be able to stab? That's what he's doing. Is he's a big, big shot down here. He won't pull it up there, Buster. Believe me. All right, now he says he saw a great white throne, him and sat upon it, from the whore whose face the heavens earth fled away. In the book of Proverbs, chapter 20, verse 8 and 9, it says there, it says, uh, a king that sits on a throne uh, in judgment, scatters away all evil with his eyes. Who can say, I am pure, I am cleansed from my sin? Proverbs 20, verse 8 and 9. Someday, sometime, someplace, God's going to square them accounts. And if he isn't, he's not God. I understand the atheistic position perfectly. If there's any God up there, he has to straighten them out. And he's going to do it. But it ain't all going to be done here. But it's going to get done up there. Oh, and he says, I saw a great bright hope and sat, him, sat upon it from before whose face the heaven and earth fled away, and there was no place found for them. Then he says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and the dead were judged out of those things written in the books, every man according to his works, and whoever was not found in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. My, what a scene. My, what a scene. Uh, a man that a man that a man that's not a, a, afraid of something like that just hasn't got good sense. I mean, tonight, my God, people, if tonight God took your life and showed it how suppose we had Sunday night your life, and next Sunday night life my life, and next Sunday night Brother Mitchell's life, and next Sunday night Brother Dickman's life, and next Sunday night Brother Donovan's life, and they went through the congregation, and every Sunday night here we had a two-hour film on you of everything you thought and said and done the last twenty years. Well, this place would be filled with vomit and you need medics. People passing out. It'd be sickening. I tell those fellows in jail where I go to preach, I say, and they sometimes raise an eyebrow, you know, they, they're kind of naive about some things. They shouldn't be, but about religious things, they come kind of naive. And I'll tell them if I had to give account for everything I've thought in the last 24 hours, I'd go to hell like a bullet. And I see someone kind of shaking their head, you know, unbelief. Don't kid me. I know myself better than they know me. If a fellow had good sense, that'd rattle him. But some folks haven't got any sense. Now bring him in. I'm going to take a fellow here and bring him in. I'm going to stand him for the judgment and see how he made out. I'm going to put clothes on him and his filthy rags. Because the Bible says all our righteousness are his filthy rags. So I'm going to bring in a sinner here, big mouth down here. He's having a time up here, up here at this judgment. I'm going to bring him in and he said the, the books were open. The books were open. I read over there in the book of Daniel. He said, I watched and saw the ace of days came whose throne was a fiery stream 
and a fiery stream issued forth and came forth before him, and ten thousand times ten thousand before him, and thousand thousands a judge with him. The judgment was set, and the books were open. Open come the books. Like the old song says, my Lord is right, my Lord is right, my Lord is right all the time. My Lord is right, my Lord is right, my Lord is right all the time. Uh, Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. And since you got up this morning, you've been writing a record. And it's in a book. And uh, so once in a while, we don't know you're singing a lot here, but we sang, used to sing a lot when I was first saved up in the mountains of Carolina. We sang a song that said, there was a time on earth when the book of heaven, an old account was standing of sin yet unforgiven. My name was at the top and many things below. I went up to the keeper and settled it long ago. Long ago, long ago, yes, the old account was settled long ago, and the record's clear today, for he washed my sins away when the old account was settled long ago. That thing ends and says, O sinner, seek the Lord, repent of all your sin, for thus he hath commanded if you would enter in, and if you should live a hundred years below, fear not, you'll not regret it. You settled it long ago. It's a book. When I went to Bob Jones University, I had a, uh, a professor there named Brokenshaw, uh, Brokenshire. And Brokenshire was a college professor from Princeton and Harvard, Yale, and Heidelberg. He could speak and read and write eight different languages. About time we got to Revelation, we were talking about the passage, and he said to me in the class, he said, Mr. Ruckman, he said, we do not have to necessarily believe that, that God has literal books written. I said, yeah, we don't have to necessarily believe he doesn't either, so why not believe it? Those fellows aren't going to bushwhack me. Well, we do not have to necessarily believe. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to necessarily not believe what you're what you, what you taking the negative for. That stuff. You think, look here, if you take my voice and put it through that piece of metal right there and run that thing up there and put it on a tape and send that tape to Hong Kong and a guy play, back, play it back and hear me breathing and talking, you think God has some sense, wouldn't you? You don't think God's got a record of what you said? People are weird. I mean, you take this picture of me here with this camera here, and take this picture of me up here and doing this stuff in the chalk, and you take that thing and throw it out across the house, stop, and the guy 50 miles away can pick it up and reassemble it in the living room. And you think God hadn't got some sense? Don't you worry, he got it on record. And someday the books will be open, this fellow faced the record. Now I'm going to bring him in and let him face the record. I saw an advertisement for a movie one time, and it was about one of these two typical uh, modern stories, you know. And the advertisement said, filmed on location inside a woman's soul. <laughs> isn't, that, 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 isn't, that, isn't that impressive? Filmed on location inside a woman's soul. You've never seen a photograph of anything filmed inside a woman's soul. But I said, I'm going to do it for you right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you up soul of judgment. I'll give you a film on location. <clears throat> I'll bring a soul in for the job and see how he makes out. Let's just see how he made out. Hollywood never could get it right. I've never known Hollywood to get anything right. Uh, when they made that picture in the Exodus, a fellow said when that thing was over, they shouldn't have called that thing the Exodus. They ought to call it the Sexodus. <laughs> I mean, they got a picture in Salome where she danced. That's a belly dancer. They got a, a message in the Ten Commandments, Thou thou shalt not commit adultery. They got a, a movie on David and Bathsheba. That's the guy messing with the guy's wife. Why don't they make a movie on the revival at Ephesus? Wouldn't that be a good one? I think that'd be a good one. They'd have made a movie on the prodigal son, you know, one time. I didn't go see it. And, but I bet I know how it went. Of course, I don't know for sure because I didn't go see it. And I'm not going to go to see it to see if what I'm getting to say is true or not. Uh, and if my German shepherd went and saw it, I'd shoot him before he got through the front gate when he got home. <laughs> You're not going to fool me with all these little Christian titles in these movies, you know. But I bet you that movie on the prodigal son, I bet you they made the hero the young, the young man. I bet they did. I know they did. I didn't go to the seat to know what they did. The hero in that story is the old man, the father. So you can't get it straight with Hollywood. They made a movie one kind of time called The Damn Don't Cry. They do too. Christ said weep and wailing a gnashing of teeth. They made a movie about a chronic alcoholic woman one time. I think it was Joan Crawford played the part. And it said, I'll cry tomorrow. I thought to myself, that's a lie. That's a lie. Sister, you, you're a chronic alcoholic. You don't cry tomorrow. You cry tomorrow, and the day after that, 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 and the day... Don't kid me. My mom is a chronic alcoholic. Tell me all about it, okay? Don't preach me in that stuff. I know what's going on. I'll cry tomorrow. You cry a lot longer than that, baby. I'll tell you. They show those pictures up there, those beautiful young women with their wine glasses and cocktails in their hands. You don't wind up looking like that, sister. 
You want to look back like that old that old sea hag in Popeye the Sailor Man. That's what you wind up looking like. That's what you wind up looking like. Hollywood never could get it right. They never could get it right. I believe the only honest title I ever saw in an arcade advertising a theater, uh, a movie, was on an outdoor theater. It used to be out here on uh, that back cutoff that goes high, par- parallel with 29 going out north of town, headed toward Cantonment out there. They used to have a drive-in theater out there. And I saw an arcade one that time, and the name of the movie was Everything But the Truth. <laughs> I thought to myself, that's a good, that's an honest title there. Everything But the Truth. All right, let's bring in this fellow and see how he made out. Bring him in clad in the filthy rags of his own self-righteousness. No family, no wife, no children, no preacher to blame the problem on, no deacon to blame the problem on. The book says, so then every one of us should give account of himself to God. And brethren, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, whether you stand there before you, or if you stand before the white throne judgment, and this fellow stand before the white throne judgment, you stand there and it's you and him one-on-one face-off. That's what they call it in hockey. It's a face-off. It's you and him. There's nobody there but you and him. If you ever stop thinking about this, this is why we preach as we tell you at the end of a message, and I know you get tired of hearing it, but we say every head bowed, every eye shut. And if we're honest preachers, we're not doing that to get away with something that you're not to see. That is the idea. The idea is that uh, at the end of the message, we, we want to get rid of ourselves so you're not looking at us because we're going to go. And then look at, look, you look at the building, it's going to burn. For a little while before you go home, or whatever you're going to do, would you just shut your eyes so it's just you and him? That's what it's for. The idea gets you cut you off or you just have to deal with him. You say, why is that? Because that's how it's going to wind up anyway. Now, you're ready to go? You Christian people, ready to go tonight? Stand up there, you here, and Jesus Christ right there. And then have it out. Nobody else around. No wife, no kids. I'll give account for you, a congregation, but you won't be there to answer for me. I'll, be, I'll have to answer myself. So that I was to give account of himself to God. In this fellow come, let's see what kind of a record he made. Well, uh, first of all, he's a, a murderer. I am not a murderer. I never committed, no, they'll, they'll alibi. Well, there's a passage over there in the, in, there's a passage over there in the book of, uh, there's a passage over there in the book of Romans where Paul says uh, that in the day that God judges the world, how is he going to overcome when he's judged? When he's judged, when God is judged. You know what that means? It means when unsaved people get up there, they're going to try to find something wrong with God. And he says, how will he overcome when he's judged? Yea, let God be true and every man a liar, as it is is written. You know what God's going to do? He's going to pull the scripture on you. You get up there and try to condemn him. There'll be people coming up there. I wasn't one of the elect. You didn't draw me. You said, except the Father draw me, you never drew me. Don't you worry. You get up there and you're a soul at stake, you'll say anything. You, you'll reach deep to get an alibi. They'll, they'll have all the questions, and I'll tell you something, he'll have all the answers. Some, someday, and I've done this, not whether you've ever done it or not, but someday you ought to take your Bible, go through your New Testament, and just mark all the times that the Pharisees asked Christ a question, or the Sadducees, you know, or the scribes, and then go through it and mark all the times that he asked them a question. And see who's batting average is the highest. You go through there and find all the time they ask him a question. He comes about, it is written, it is written, it is written, bam, 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 bam. He asks them a question. <laughs> he said, you, you do, you, the reason why you don't know is you don't, you do err, not knowing the scripture. Have you never read? Have you never read? Have you never read? Have you never read? They're going to guys get up there and say, what about the heathen didn't hear? What about the folks that didn't know? What about I don't know why some unsaved people think they're smarter than somebody else. I've talked with hundreds, thousands, thousands of unsaved men in the last 50 years. They all talk exactly alike. They all say exactly the same thing, identically each one of them, but every one of them says some are 50 times before I talk to the guy. They don't talk any different over there in, in, in India. And when I get up before a Bible forum in India, and I've got 900 Hindu pastors, converted Hindu pastors sitting there, the question they ask are the ones you ask. Same bunch of questions. You take those fellows back in the bushes that, that Johnson's dealing with, they'll come up with it. Well, if that's true, why didn't God tell, about us, tell us about it before now? They'll come up with it. Well, why would God send a fellow to hell forever if he'd never done anything wrong? They'll come up with it. <clears throat> the judgment men are going to speak up and try to justify themselves. You're guilty of murder. You can't give me that charge. I never killed anybody. 
I never killed anybody in manslaughter. Never killed anybody in combat. I've never shot anybody. You can't call me a murderer. I never killed anybody. What makes you think you got to kill somebody to be a murderer? Well, where do Americans get these peculiar religious ideas from? Where did you get that idea that you had to kill somebody to be a murderer? That's a strange thing you cooked up there. I mean, you're supposed to be enlightened people. You're supposed to have a Bible to read. Something's supposed to hold happen somewhere between the time of Adam and when you got here. You know, what, you know what that book says? That book says, he that hates his brother in his heart is a murderer, and you know no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now, how about that? He that hates his brother in his heart is a murderer. A man, a man is not a killer because he kills. He kills because he's a killer. <clears throat> See, we get it backwards. We catch the fellow and say he's a murderer. How do you know he killed so-and-so? Well, he was a murderer before he killed so-and-so. You say, why? Well, because if he hadn't been a murderer, he wouldn't have killed him. You don't kill somebody unless you sit around the planet. Now, I'm not talking about manslaughter. The Bible got stuff covered in manslaughter back there in the book of Numbers. The Bible covered anything you ever brought up, and the Lord knows where the verses are. When it comes to killing people and malice of forethought, that is, blowing the brains out, hitting them with a club to get what they have, or stealing assault and battery and that kind of thing, you think about it before you do it. Uh, haven't you ever laid around in your bed at night and, and figured how you'd like to get back to somebody? Now, you good godly people surely don't do that, do you? <laughs> You ever lie there and think about something? You just get them just right, you know, what you do to them. Was it all nice and sweet? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I look at my crowd, I look out across this congregation tonight, said, uh, say, Seth, fellow sitting back there, he clean cut and got a good shave, carries a bite with him, he must be a nice fella. He couldn't, he couldn't be a killer. And God might look down and see right through the top of that ceiling tonight and through your clothes and through your heart and say, Seth, fellow back there, he got a heart black, say he's a spade, he got a switch blade in his hand ready to do business. I mean, God knows. God knows. All right, he's a murderer. He's that. What else is he? An adulterer. Well, I never did commit adultery. You can't get me for that. I'm not an adulterer. I never stepped out of my wife. I never even married twice. I never even got a divorce. You can't get me for adultery. What makes you think you've got to step out in your wife to be an adulterer? Where do you get these funny ideas you pick up from, you know? Whoever puts it away, wife and marries another, commits adultery, you know. Is that right? You know, one time I was preaching up in, uh, let's see, Memphis, I think it was. And uh, right before I came up there, there was a college professor over there at Mid-South uh, Seminary who didn't like me. I have a way of making friends among college faculties. Most of my friends are college faculty members. And uh, he phoned up the pastor where I was preaching. He said, you having Ruckman in here for a meeting? And the guy said, uh, yeah. And he said, I didn't know you had adulterers in your pulpit. And he said, uh, yeah, we have them regularly. <laughs> and he said, what? And that pastor said, I'm a daughter myself. He said, what? He said, I didn't know you were married twice. He said, I've been married twice. But he said, you know, the Bible said, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after in his heart hath already committed. Click. Little trouble with the Greek there, professor? Little trouble with the original manuscripts, was it? Don't you know? You know, back about 1920, when judges were half straight and uh, weren't controlled by the news media, they had some decisions that were pretty, uh, they were pretty, pretty biblical. Now, about 1920, they had a case out in St. Louis where a famous businessman there was pretty known in the community had his wife. Uh, she claimed she was raped, and they tried the fellow in court, found him guilty of rape, and sentenced him, I think, to five years, something like that. And all through that trial, that uh, businessman's uh, rich wife would come to to uh, court, you know, dressed in Oh, a dress tight as a scuba diver, you know, and so material so thin a fly could have flown through that bust on the wing and showed everything she had, you know, about five inches above the knee down. And that thing was over. That judge called her and her husband up in front of the court, and while they were still there, and then the people there, and he said, uh, Madam, are you a prostitute? And boy, she just turned crimson, and the husband had to stand around and spit and sputter, and she said, My God, no! And he said, Well, if your wares aren't for sale, don't advertise them. Clack. That Bible said, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after authority commit adultery in his heart with her. Uh, did you understand that? With her, the two involved. I know what your girls say. I'm not responsible for what a man thinks. Yes, you are. I abstain from all appearance of evil. By those people, movie stars that sell their bodies to be displaying before men, move after movie after movie after movie, as far as God is concerned, those people are professional prostitutes. 
You say, I'm not responsible. Yes, you are responsible. You're responsible for trying to get attention the wrong way. And he said, whoever looks after one, the lust after his heart hath already committed adultery with her. With her. Now, there's some things you can't help. I understand that. But you'd be amazed how much you could help that you don't. <laughs> now, I'm not one of those preachers. I'm one of those preachers where don't do this and don't do that, do to this, do to that. Those are called legalists. Now, I'm not like that. We don't have any, we don't have any rules here or a whole bunch of regulations. I've learned something from dealing with Christians. You can't make them spiritual no matter how many rules you give them. You got them rules nailed down, they still won't be spiritual. But still, I'm telling you, that book says abstain from all... If you're not a whore or sister, don't look like one. If you're not a slut, don't dress like one. If you want to be treated like a lady, then act like a lady and talk like a lady and walk like a lady and dress like a lady. And if you don't, don't get surprised if you get treated the other way. Because we men are not as dumb as we look. The thing is, you ladies, you think you have this little conceit. Why, we, she sure fooled him. You know, that little snip just wraps him around her finger, you know. No, she don't. Not if he don't want to be wrapped. You know how women get into sin? They're talked into it. You know how a man gets into sin? He thinks about it and plans it. You know what that is? First Timothy chapter 2. Read it before you go to bed tonight. First Timothy chapter. You know, I'm quiet on me here tonight. Don't you? <laughs> Listen, you want a straight? You want a straight? I'll give it to you a straight. You want, you want, you want, you want, everyone will come right over the plate waist high, brother, right in the middle. Take a cut at it. <laughs> he's an adulterer. That is not, he's a thief. I am not a thief. I have never stolen anything in my life. I've never robbed a 7 Eleven. I've never held up a bank. You know, I've never cheated an income tax. I am not a thief. <laughs> what makes you think you have to do that to be a thief, you know? A I man, all you do is rob a gas station of 20 bucks. You got problems, man. Uh, two, two, two thieves were in jail, and one was reading, studying, the other one wasn't doing much anything. And his bunkmate said to him one day, he said, You ought to study and prove yourself. He said, I'm studying. He said, When we get out of here, you'll just still be a common thief, but I'll be an embezzler. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you steal 50 bucks from a cash register, they might give you 10 or 15 years, you know. But if you can steal $20,000 from the highway department, they'll make a city commissioner out of you. <laughs> if you're going to do it, on a, you want to go do it, you might as well do it on a big scale, you know, if you're going to do it. But you say, well, what is a thief? A thief is somebody who takes something and doesn't leave an adequate return. That's what a thief is. If you break the guy's house and steal a $100 watch and leave him $100, you haven't really stolen it. You bought it. <laughs> <laughs> A thief takes something and doesn't leave an adequate return. That's what a thief is on anything. Now, you come to school here to learn the Bible. You're a student. You pay money to me to teach you the Bible. If I don't teach you the Bible, I'm a crook. How many will say amen to that? Let me hear you say amen. Why don't you say it at the other schools? They tell you the same thing. Come out and learn the Bible. You get there, they cut it down and take it away from you. Thief! <laughs> Stop in the name of the law. <laughs> He's a crook. <laughs> I preached one time in a prison. I forget where it was. It's been about 50, well, 50, 11, 60 now, a bunch of them. And I can't keep them all straight. But I preached one of them. I was drawing this thing. And I was talking about, are you a thief? And two of them right back in the middle were talking to each other. I heard one of them say, I, I, I never done that. The other fellow said, I ain't done it either. <laughs> you hear them talking. They talk back to you while you're preaching. <laughs> And I went right on with the spiel. And in the spiel, you know what you say next? I wasn't planning to get him. I just preached when I'm getting ready to preach. And then you know what you say next? You say, did you ever steal 10 years off your mother's life the way you live with her worrying about you? And one of those guys looked right at the other guy and said, I never thought about that. <laughs> just serious, a heart attack, man. Let me ask you this. You ever steal the bloom of purity off a young girl's cheeks? You sure you're not just crooked as a dog's hind leg? I bet we got people in this bill of nights are crooked. If you fell through a barrel of fish hooks, you would get stuck one time. <laughs> got to screw your socks on in the morning. We've had guys come down and go to school and work our trustees over and our deacons for money. 
small time right here. Never paid back a dime of it. Not a cop making dime. And they're preaching out on the street and passing out tracks. Uh, when I when I preach, I don't do this much anymore because I don't preach many Southern Baptist churches I used to. But I used to preach just about exclusively in Southern Baptist churches down south. When I get one of those churches, I'd always do this somewhere in the meeting. I'd say, "Everybody stand." They stand up. I'd say, "Now, if you never stole a watermelon." I said, I'm not trying to trick you. I just want to know, if you never stole a watermelon in your life, sit down. And I have never been in a church of four or five hundred where more than ten people sat down. And I was preaching over there in the First Baptist Church of, of Fairhope one time. And I said, uh, now, how many, stand up. And they all stood up. I said, if you never stole a watermelon, sit down. And about eight sat down in the congregation, oh, around, trouble, around 300 someplace. They sat down, and I saw one well-dressed lady in the back, you know, white glove, you know, upper-class boy, hoity-toity, blue blood man, posh. And she's back there, and she, she was, she, saw like this, and they, then she sat up again, and she starts down, she sat up again, face beat red, just beat red, and she kind of scoots down, and she get back up again. <laughs> At the end of the service, I came around her, and I said, what's the matter, sister, you having no trouble there? <laughs> And, and she said, well, she said, Brother Ruckman, she said, we did do that when I was a little girl, but we didn't call it stealing them, we just called it taking them. <laughs> That's what they call it in Wall Street in Washington, D.C., same thing. They're a thief, crook, stealing, stealing your money, stealing your money. He's a thief. I don't know. He's a liar. You know, we've raised a whole generation of people. They've been watching TV and news media for so long. They just all lie, just naturally they breathe air. Back in the old days, when you called a fellow a liar, you know, you had a fight on your hands. You don't anymore. You can call them liars, they'll laugh at you. I saw a preacher, I preached a friend of mine, I don't know, Adipogus, Georgia. His name was, uh, what was his name? He was a graduate, Williams. I think Paul Williams, he led, uh, he led that, uh, that chaplain of Bourbon Street to Christ. Who was that fellow's name? Uh, Harrington. He led him to Christ. And he had a little, uh, church up in Sweetwater, Alabama. Uh, on the way up to Dixon Mills and Thomasville up in there. And Paul Williams was passing out of Pogus, Georgia, and what, during a meeting they had a big liquor fight, and the mayor got involved in it, and the books got involved in it, and the voters got involved in it. You know, the, the, the big shots ran things, wanted to sell liquor, and some stuff, and got it his way, but they got liquor in the town. And during that meeting, I went down the street with this Paul Williams in a car, and he pulled up alongside that mayor, parked the car and got out, went right up to him, and hit him all over the street, and shook his finger right in his face. And he said, you dirty so-and-so, you messed with those books and chained that stuff in the books about that book. You're nothing but a cotton-picking liar. And I don't forget that fellow. He just kind of laughed. said, well, that's politics, you know. That's all he said. That's politics, you know. I back to called him a liar. He just smacked him in the face said, choose your weapon. You'd be out there in the, in the morning, 8 o'clock or 7 o'clock with a pair of pistols. But that's politics, you know. He's <laughs> a liar like a dog. People do it all the time. I tried to make it out in the meeting one night, preacher. You know. I tried to be there one night. Of course, I won't promise I'll be there. I won't say, well, I won't, but I'll... Come on, you big liar. You big liar. I, for years and years, I carried a dollar bill around with me, and I finally got rid of it in Pensacola, talking to a German woman who lived right over here off Johnson Avenue, about a block, by the, where that little store used to be. And her name was... Uh, her name was... Oh, um, a buyer. B-A-Y-E-R-S. Buyers. She was native-born German. She married a Texan. And I was doing personal work over in that area back there. But after we came out here shortly after that. And by that time, I'd done, already dealt with thousands of people and knocked on thousands of doors, done kind of all kind of soul winning. And I carried a dollar bill on with me for something like 20 years. And I promised the Lord the first time I talked to an honest person that says, I'm not coming, so don't look for me. I'm going to give them this dollar bill just for being honest. Because they'll always say, well, now, preacher, I won't say I'll be there. I won't, I won't, I won't, I won't, which means I ain't going to be there. Now, come on, gentlemen. Suppose I phone you up and I said, we'll be down there at the at the wharf or pier number six at uh, 530 in the morning. So-and-so's got the drinks. I got the sandwiches. Don't worry about the bait. We'll take care of that. We're going to be fishing all day. Do you want to come? Well, I won't say I'll be there. And I won't tell you when I won't. I will. But I, I might. Uh-huh. If you want to be there, you'll say, I'll be there, unless you can't make it. If you can't make it, you'll say, I won't be there. Right? Well, they start this stuff. Well, I won't say, you won't say it because you're a blankety-blank liar. That's your problem. And I carried that dollar bill on me for about 20 years, and right over here in this area, back here, in a mile from here, I don't guess, maybe about a, well, almost not quite a mile, 
I knocked at the door, and a German house frau there, about 40 years old, answered the door. I told her who I was, where my church was, and gave her a tract, and asked her to come out to the meeting, and she said, I don't believe what you believe, so don't look for me, because I'm not going to be there. And I pulled out that dollar bill and gave that dollar bill to her. She was not take it, you know, but I offered it to her. That's the first honest person I'd heard in 20 years. One of the kind of things. A lie like a dog. Lie like a dog. Now look at this stuff here, you know. You know what this stuff is? You live in a day and age when, you know, sin used to be uh, uh, scarlet and eternity used to be long and hell used to be hot and that kind of thing. But now they've got all these other names for things. You have red sins and orange sins and chartreuse sins and uh, and all, it, it, everything got kind of gray, you know. Back in the old days, they had a, they had a word for it. And I say the old days, uh, I'm old enough now to say that. Uh, my generation was a bunch of plain talkers. We talked plain. We didn't talk like your generation talks. Your generation, pretend, they pretend to talk so plain and so clear, but they don't. They don't. You never saw a Donahue show or a talk show or an Oprah show or a, a couple of mixed couple show. Even when they came on naked, they've been doing that too lately. But you never saw one of those shows yet where they call a sex, uh, a sex pervert by his real name. I wouldn't, I wouldn't speak his real name. I'm told, uh, you know, sound speech can't be condemned, but we had a word for faggots. It was real clear. It was a, what you call a compound word. It was made of two words. You never heard that on any TV show in your life. You know, you know why? Because you're a bunch of mealy mouthed people who don't tell the truth. You want to talk about unbridled lust, you call it, uh, you call it, uh, extra, um, uh, uh, premarital, you know, premarital sex. You mean fornication? Got a little problem there? So it was adult consent. You mean it's adultery? You say, well, they're gay. You mean they're faggots? They're queers? The double-breasted finks, the Frisco fairy fruit lamb faggots, don't you mean? You mean the sodomites, that what you mean? I mean, put me in one of those talk toes, I bet I could blow you every switch on there. And... Plain talker, you're not a plain talker. Your whole generation is mealy mouth. Now the guy, I'll get back to this in a minute. But the, but the guys I came up with, they had a way of saying the thing. That when they finished saying it, you knew what they said. And it wasn't always good. I couldn't repeat a lot of the expression, but they were very vivid. I mean, the fellow had been drunk all night, and his eyes were in rush con- uh, 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 bad condition. The next morning, his eyes, we had a certain expression about a guy's eyes, what, he, what his eyes looked like. And it was very vivid, believe me. Uh, one of the fellow kept saying, we, do the, we need to do this, we need to do that. And we'd say, what do you mean, we? Have you got a... And then we had a way to be finished that. I couldn't repeat it. But, but it, believe me, it was very vivid. Very clear. You couldn't possibly miss it. <laughs> I'm probably about those Al Donahue of uh, Ankerberg shows, you know, on the quiz program, you know, I'd get up there and say, what do you make of that verse that calls that Roman Catholic whore, Revelation? Uh, click, boop, spit, and pop, pop, pop. You go up there, you get buttons and bells all the way through there, boy. They can't talk plain. They can't talk plain. And me, I'm a plain fella. You say, no, you're very complex, Brother Rudman. Don't kid me. I've, I've lived myself a long time. I know what I am. I'm plain. I don't have any socks on right now. I bet you do. <laughs> I met some little girl up here. I get a Lavetto's little girl. She went around here. I was kidding with her, stepping on her bare feet. And I told her she's a smart little girl for not having any shoes on. She is. If I get away, then I do it too. I'm just plain. When I get out of an airplane, come back to the house, my wife will tell you, I would drive the car up, and I'll take my coat off and kick my shoes off, and I'll be out in that dirt before I get in the house. I like, I'm plain. I'm, I like, before I was saved, we liked our sin hot and raw and plain and rotten and wicked and didn't make any bones about it. Nothing was cool. Nothing was fixed up. Nothing made it look good. It was all that out of hell. And that's the way we liked it. I mean, your generation, your, I have the same trouble with Christianity I had with unsaved people before I was saved. I had too many unsaved friends that wanted to kind of, you know, to fix it up a little bit so a little bit nicer, you know. That's the trouble I have with you now. You Christian people. You want a little bit nicer, you know. It's a little bit more palatable, a little bit more smooth. I like it. All out, one way, white or black, up or down, heaven or hell. Cut the line clear. I don't like any foggy lines going through there. To me, to me, candy is chocolate. If it's chocolate, it's candy. You say, well, we like, I didn't say you couldn't like something, I just said candy is chocolate. Now the other stuff, you like, okay, sweets, alright? Bonbons, 
All right? <laughs> candy is chocolate. And if it ain't chocolate, it ain't candy. With me, ice cream is vanilla. You swear about the others. They're frozen desserts, you know, the different kind of thing. But, but, but ice cream is vanilla. And okay, like strawberry, orange sherbet or strawberry pecan or pecan this or pecan dip or nutty chip or whatever you got a hold of. But ice cream is vanilla and candy is chocolate. And a potato, you bake it. And you put butter and salt and pepper on it. Never mayonnaise. Mayonnaise. My star, man. And put little sprigs of parsley and little red pepper. <laughs> hey, man. Butter, eat the whole thing. Eat the skin with it. You eat the skin with it. You don't ever leave the skin. You eat the whole cotton pig and potato. You say, what is that? Just plain? Just plain. Just like it, just plain. I can't, you already know this, I can't stand this generation, the one before. I backed into the 20th century kicking. I really did. My, 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 my environmental adjustment would be somewhere around about 1880, 1890 someplace. I think electricity is the devil. I think car is the devil. I know gasoline motor is the devil. <laughs> I think shoes the devil. I think the whole thing is the devil. I think. I, I, I like it plain. It's too, it's too sophisticated. It's too, uh, too many euphemisms. It's all fixed up. It's all dressed up. It's all clothed. I can't stand professionalism. I can't stand to buy a Bible that says genuine Morocco leather. You pick it up and look at it. It's been sprayed on there. Yeah. It's been sprayed. Honest to God. He took that thin sheet, put glue on it, and sprayed the leather on there. See? Now you have a Bible there. If you had a Bible every one five years, I bet it's busted in the book of Revelation, busted the Genesis in the binding. Isn't it? You know why they don't bind them in Genesis and Revelation? So they'll tear it and you have to get another one. Why not put the binding clear around the whole book? Then it wouldn't fall apart as quick. Thief! Thief! Cook! 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 You say who? The Bible publishers. <laughs> that a fine bunch of crooks? It's a matter, it's a matter of I don't, I'm, I, I'm not name calling, I'm not identifying things. I go in a place, I want some shoe polish. They ain't got any shoe polish in the place. Boot refiner, wax refinisher, the, this, the, you know, it's on the shine. I want some, I want some shoe polish. You have a shoe polish? I go, I want some toilet paper. You got a roll of toilet paper? Oh, it, it's tissue, you know. And, uh, <laughs> I saw an advertisement one time, had a car look, at, look like half a page. I don't know what the thing was, just about the color of a rotten Easter egg. It'd take you 30 cents to put that thing in the parking meter, take up three places. And it said, more than an automobile, a new concept in automotive experience. Ah, your father's mustache. A new concept in automotive experience. It's a pile of rolling junk. <laughs> I've had 17 cars, and every one of them was a pile of rolling junk, and it was just a matter before it became a pile of rolling junk. And I used to, I used to envy, go by these car lots, see those brand new cars sitting out there? I don't envy them anymore. Oh, sir, boy. No, sir, man. I like to say, ah, uh ah, -huh. mm, yeah. And you get that thing, it'll drive along that first thing, you know, the clock doesn't work. Then the radio doesn't work. Then the heater doesn't work. Then something goes wrong with the horn. Then something with the, the visor sticks. You can't get it down. Or the mirror breaks off, you know. And then, then, then it's the brake line. And then it's the, the trouble is the, the stud of the Stanifran and the Johnson Ron doesn't get the doohickey where the tit batty should be. That's the problem. That'll be 500 bucks. <laughs> Everything you see out there rolling out there is just a rolling pile of junk. It's just a matter of talk before the time off, before they all fall to pieces. They got such ways of saying it. I never liked funerals. I haven't conducted a funeral for a good while, and I hope I never have to conduct another one. But if you're a pastor, you will be called upon to conduct funerals, and I've conducted a lot of them. But I don't like funerals. You know why? I, I don't like artificial things. And you're artificial, I don't like it. I don't like any kind of jam. If it's blueberries, you put them in your mouth off the tree. If it's blackberries, you put them in your mouth off the bushes. If it's the pears, you take them off the tree and bite at them. If it's oranges, you bite them. You don't take orange and pineapple and cut it up and put it in meat in the oven. You take the coconut down, jab a stick to the top of it, and suck the milk out, and then break it open on a rock and eat it. That's what you do. It's plain. Just plain. Just make it plain, man. Plain. And it's all this artificial stuff just, just eats me up. Just eats me up. All the show, the strut, the put on. 
I mean, you take out the funeral. There's a casket there. What is it? Well, it's this uh, ivory, you know, and all made up of this stuff, you know, and it's got the stuff studded, you know, so it looks like it has uh, money in it, and it's uh, cushioned, you know, with this silk and velvet. See how pretty it is? That ain't nothing pretty about death. You can't make death pretty about what you do it. You take a little white casket about that long down there, and a mom and daddy sitting down there, you know, about 20 years old, bawling their eyes out. You can't, I don't care what color, you can't paint that casket. You can't make it look pretty. Death ain't pretty, boys and girls. Now, I can't change the undertaker business, and I'm not about to try to. I wouldn't think of doing a thing like that. Couldn't do it anyway. It's one of the most lucrative business in the world. I understand that, but I don't like it. You can't make me like it. I don't like it. I don't like flowers at a funeral. Why? They stink. You say, where? I, they shouldn't have any business at a funeral. Bodies don't smell like flowers. Dead body. You smell a dead body after it's been dead about eight or nine days? You want those flowers there for to make it kind of, you know, make it smell good. Death don't smell good. It don't look good. I don't like any of that stuff. They said the body's down there at the, the funeral home. Home? <laughs> That's your home? <laughs> in my home, man, there ain't no funeral home. That's a morgue. The body is, the body is at rest in, in Woodlawn Memorial Gardens. You mean a graveyard? You say, what, you're so crude? No, man, I just like it plain. You don't expire, you drop dead. You kick the buckets, you pop off. <laughs> they don't bury you in a memorial garden. You got a hole in the ground. They put you to bed with a shovel. <laughs> I, now I know a lot of you folks aren't that way, but I guess that's how you're raised. I like the stuff just plain and raw, man. No frills, thank you. Now, my wife, my wife is the best cook in the country. I know that. She's probably the best cook in the, in the world, truth or no, and pretty close to it. She can cook you any kind of thing. She can cook you a, a seafood dinner, a Mexican dinner, a German dinner, a Chinese dinner, a Japanese dinner, a Philippine dinner, a Russian dinner, God knows, all that kind of stuff. But I, she has a lot of books at home on how to fix meals, you know, all those different ways to fix them. And what they do in these good housekeeping, home and garden and stuff, they have these beautiful photographs that are made for, to photograph, you know. My God, don't need to read that stuff. <laughs> I mean, that, that stuff is laid out there so a little orange thing is here and a pink thing over here and a couple of slices of green here is laid out to make a nice photogenic setup. You can get a better meal at church than fried chicken. That's right. That's right. So fancy. I was down in St. Petersburg one time. Got down there, had a rich friend down there and a lot of folks down there got all kinds of money. And he got us to a private plane, flew us 25 miles to a private restaurant on a private runway. And we got in that plane, the twin motor says, and got up there, he let me fly it up in the air, you know, and coming down, he gonna let me land it, or he acted like he was, and I, I took it down about the treetop, and I let go of my, uh, steering wheel, and I said, grab it, man, I ain't gonna fuck, I'm not gonna touch that thing, man. I, he's gonna fly up there in the air, but that getting down and taking off, that's something else. And we got out there and landed that private strip and got out, and there was a restaurant there. I think the lowest price meal in that restaurant was $13 in 1970. In 1970. It'd be about 25 bucks now. I never ate such a rotten meal in all my life. I think those peas were canned. Canned English peas. It's like squirting water for your teeth. and <laughs> bite into them. <laughs> but but it, was, it was fixed, you know, so fancy. You know, fellas just uh, pushes a button on the table and they come in and take your plate off. There's already a plate on your table when you get there. They take it off to serve you on another one. Why? Just putting on the door, rich class. Count me out! <laughs> Get out of here! <laughs> so, three forks, four spoons, two knives, you know, guess which one to pick up. Use your fingers. <laughs> never have liked it, never will like it. You can't make death beautiful. I don't want to be, if I, tarry, if the Lord tarries and I die, don't you dare bury me in one of those big, uh, big jewel, brass handled copper things. Just get a plain pine box, okay? And leave one end loose so I can get out in a hurry when the Lord comes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a matter of taking it straight or taking the thing all mixed up. The world is always trying to make sin look beautiful. They're always trying to make something bad look good. That's called the power of positive thinking. 
It's the power of hypocritical lies. They put a bunch of movie there. Call me Curious Yellow. A uh, color purple. A pretty baby. Taxi driver. You know. Suddenly last summer. Now see those titles I gave you? Every title I gave you was a filthy, filthy immoral two hour exhibition of pornography. And not a one of them was named so you'd catch it. And that, uh, the movies I just named were Taxi Driver, Pretty Baby. Those things were advertised for Pensacola News Journal and 500 dailies and promoted. And there isn't anybody coming up in a high school or middle school even know what was implied by those terms because the terms were completely misleading. They were nothing but pornographic films. But they gave them a nice title so you would know what it was you got in there. Liar. Crook. Thief. That's the stuff. Artie points his hand at that fellow, you know, and this fellow comes in and he faces the record. He faces the record and the Lord points his finger at him and he says, Depart me, you cursed and everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. You say, do you mean to tell me, Ruckman, that God sent a guy to burn in hell for a few little things like that? No, sir, he sure won't. That should be an L in there. He sure won't. If you ever go to hell, it won't be for something like that. That's where Americans get that thing wrong again, you know. Think, well, I haven't done those things, so I must be all right. But those things won't send the fellow. You can't go to hell because of sin. Christ came to die for sinners and pay for sin. If you ever go to hell, and I hope you don't, but if you go to hell and burn forever, and you certainly will, and I say that with a college education and six years of seminary after that, I am telling you that you'll burn like a torch and you'll never quit burning till God dies. And there's a reason for that. Just, just as logical as gravity. Just as scientific as any law you know of in mathematics. I'll tell you what it is. You can't go to hell for stuff like that there because it's too little. You can pay for those sins in a lifetime. You don't believe it? Come on me some summer. I'll show you. I'll, I'll, I'll let you watch them paying for them. You can pay for that stuff here. Don't you know that? Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. God wouldn't burn a fellow for stuff like that. Uh, I preach in the prison and I tell him this. I say, the worst enemy you ever had, you wouldn't want to have him burn forever. I said, maybe a little while, you know, but you wouldn't want him to burn forever. And yet God let a fellow burn forever. I said that in one prison when I said, but you don't hate a guy bad enough to want to see him burn forever. And a big voice over there in my right said, I do. He had somebody in mind. I don't know who it was. Because he's just bitter and mad, you know. But really, if it, you heard him screaming 335 million years, you'd call a halt to it. No matter what they did to you. But God doesn't. What's going to do with that? I tell you, the African American does, does like Billy Graham does. He just pretends there isn't any fire. That's what he does. You're not thinking. You pay for this stuff here. God wouldn't think of letting a man burn forever for stuff like that. You murder? He saved Moses. Moses was a murderer. You're an adulterer? He saved David. David was an adulterer. You're a thief? He saved the dying thief. You can't go to hell for that stuff. You can pay for that here. You ain't going to pay forever for it. He can even save a liar. Although it's very difficult. <laughs> because when a liar gets saved, he can't believe he's saved when he is saved because he's been lying for so long he thinks God's lying. <laughs> now listen, if you ever go to hell, it'd have to be something worse than that stuff right there. It'll have to be for something like deicide, not homicide. It'll have to be something like high treason, not uh, embezzlement. It'll have to be something like uh, rebellion against the Lord of the universe, your creator. It'll have to be something big. It'll have to be something against him, not against some other fellow like you. You know, if a, if a man is sick, as long as he's sick, he's okay. But if he doesn't get well, he's going to die. I mean, a man doesn't die, you've got to understand this. A man doesn't die because he's sick. He dies because he doesn't get well. Right? As long as he's sick, he's alive, ain't he? <laughs> Here's a fellow sick. I say, what's the matter with you, son? I'm dying. I say, i got a pill to fix you up. Take it. He said, I don't want it. I say, why not? He said, I don't think it'll work. I said, look here. I tried this thing in about 8,000 people. Every one of them that took it, it worked. Try it. The guy says, I'm going to try. I say, why not? He says, well, I don't believe like you believe it. I said, look, man, you don't have to believe nothing. Just give the thing a try, will you? Open your mouth. 
I'm going to take it. I said, why not? He said, well, I believe as soon as I take it, I'll be well. I said, I know you'll be well. Open. <laughs> and the guy says, no, I, 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 I'm not ready yet. I said, why not? Yeah, I don't have the right feeling. You feel like you're dying, don't you? Yeah. Open your mouth, man. And the guy says, I can't. I said, why not? He says, because there are too many hypocrites in the church. <laughs> Now, what are you going to do with a fellow like that? He's going to die. He's going to die. You don't go to hell because of sin. You go to hell for rejecting the cure. This fellow committed a sin worse than any sin I got over here on the other side. You know what this fellow did? He looked right in the face of God's only Son dying on Calvary's cross for his sins, making his atonement and his payment. He looked him right in the, straight in the face and said, Well, when I get so I can live it, I'll come around. Well, I... I just don't look at it that way. Well, you got your way of looking at it, and I've got my way of looking at it. And you eject the cure, and you're dead meat. You know why a fellow goes to hell and burns forever? Because God lives forever. If God would just quit, you'd be okay. If God just kicked the bucket and die, you'd be all right. You see these sins here? They're committed against people who live 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years, or 90, or 100 at the most. You could pay for it in 100 years. How are you going to pay for that one? If that was God manifest in the flesh, dying on the cross for your sins, how do you pay for that in a hundred years, buddy? You don't. You start payment, and you'll quit payment when he quits breathing. See what a mess you get into? That Bible gets you in a mess. God put that book down here to show you that. And you show you he lives forever, and the sin against him has to take an eternal payment. If you want to make it, make it. I'm not going to jam something down your throat. Go do it your way, boy. But you're not going to come in here and not get warned before you go. You come here, you're going to be told when you hit the skids and face God Almighty, if you don't have any term and pay for your sins, you're going to pay for them yourself, and you ain't even going to quit paying. Now, you say, what's your case, Ruckman? Well, you know my case. I mean, not. I, boy, you think I'm going to step up there and tell him what a good person Peter S. Ruckman was? <laughs> not me, boy. Not me, man. I'm taking my chances right here. I'm saying, uh, the old account was large and growing every day, for I was always sitting and never tried to pay. But when I looked ahead and saw the pain and woe, I said that I would settle and settle it long ago. And my sins are washed away. Why? The old account was settled. I got to settle. Now, maybe some things I haven't got settled. You haven't got to settle, Christian. We always have problems come up. But thank God. Eternity isn't one of them. <laughs> you gotta get that thing. That's where you get the joy of the Lord. You get the, you get the joy of the Lord. You know, from this suddenly feeling that somebody put some goose on you and you gopped over and it flopped over and you began to flip out. The joy comes from believing what God said about your salvation. He said, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now you're gonna get there and try to justify yourself. All right, you go ahead and take your chances. Take your chances. But I don't recommend it. I don't recommend it. I recommend you fear God. And do the right thing about it. I dreamed that the great judgment morning had sound and the trumpet had blown. I dreamed that the unsaved were gathered for judgment before the white throne. From the throne stepped the bright shining angel and stood on the land and the sea. And he swore with his hand raised to heaven, that time was no longer to be. And oh, what a weeping and wailing, as the lost were told of their fate. They cried for the rocks and the mountains. They prayed, but their prayer was too late. The moral man came to the judgment. But his self-righteous rags would not do. The men who had crucified Jesus had passed off as moral men too. The soul that neglected salvation. Not tonight. I'll get saved by and by. Oh, no time now to think of salvation. For at last they had found time to die. And oh, what a weeping and wailing, as the lost were told of their fate. They cried for the rocks and the mountains. They prayed, but their prayer 
was too late. Now, don't let it be too late for you. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. We're going to stand. We're going to sing here about three stands of a song. And I want these kids to clearly all are here. Is anybody here tonight that is not sure about your salvation? You don't know where you're going to, when you die? The thing for you to do is openly confess Christ your Savior. And he said, if you confess me down here, I'll confess you up there. You say, well, I'd, I'd be taking a chance, Ruckman. Yeah, it is, but it's a better chance than doing it the other way. I'm, t- you say, I'm taking a- I realize you're taking a chance when you take God at his word. That's faith. I, you say, what chance are you taking? I'm taking the chance that if I confess him down there, when I hit there, he'll confess me. When I confess him down there as my Savior of the payment, I stop there, the Lord says to his father, he says, Father, this is one of mine. Amen. I pay for my sin. He took me down there, and I want you to take him up here. Amen. All right, let's stand. Let's stand. Let's sing uh, without the hymnal. Let's sing just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, that thou bidst me come to the old Lamb of God, I come. You have never come to Christ, your personal Savior, trusted Him and confessed Him. This invitation is for you. My associate, Brother Donovan, will be down here in front to meet you if you come. The thing for you to do is act, act, act. You die tonight, it's fixed. You die tomorrow night, it's fixed. If you live a thousand years, it's fixed. If you die next month, it's fixed. Just get that thing fixed. I know some of you have so many problems in this life, you feel like you need to put this off, you get your problem solved. You'll never get all your problems solved, you're dead. Now get this one fixed. This is a problem you can fix, get fixed tonight. All this thing out. Just as I am. Now, you see, the thing is so simple, you're just liable to miss it. It's just real simple. You owe God something because you've done wrong. You got that? Any problem with that? He gave you life, right? Then you owe him something. You gave him nothing. He gave you life. He gave you bread, gave you food, gave you mother, gave you daddy. You owe him. How are you going to pay for it? Job said, if a man is sitting against God, who will... Or Eli said that to his son, if a man sinned against God, who'll pay for him? Who'll make the payment? Joseph says to Potiphar's wife, how can I do this great evil and sin against God? The prodigal son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and thy sight, not just against daddy. I have sinned against heaven. You're old. Okay. It has to be paid. Okay. Who's going to pay it? That's all there is to it. There's nothing complicated about it. Sometimes preachers make it look like you got over 50,000 hurdles before you get there. If you love you enough to die for you and pay for it and offers you the payment, man, why don't you take the payment? You don't really want to pay it, do you? <laughs> you want to, you want to, our God's consuming fire. You want to burn as long as God burns. His eternal energy never gives out. Eternal energy. 506,000 degrees. You want to pay for it? Have him pay for it. God help you. All right, let's sing just Simon waiting not. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to be whose blood can cleanse each part You ever stop thinking about this? Someday you people that are saved are going to be at this judgment. Someday I'm going to meet every person I ever preached to. Us preachers, we may, like a, we may look like a bunch of losers here, and we are with the world. But we're on the winning side. And when this thing gets over, I'm going to look right in the face of every man, woman, child I ever preached to. Right down in front of me. Including my mother. And my daddy. And my brothers and my sisters. 
And then I'll see every one of them converted to my religion. Too late. Every knee shall bend. Every head shall bow. Of things in heaven, things on earth, and things under the earth. In hell. Hell delivereth the dead birds from them. Out comes mama. Mary Armstrong Ruckman. Bow. Down she goes. Father, John Hamilton Ruckman. Bow. Down he goes. P.R.S. Ruckman. You already bowed. Already bowed. Don't have to do it again. Why don't you get to settle tonight? You know where I'm going to be in this day? I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be up here. He said, thousand, thousand ministered to him, and ten thousand times ten thousand before him. And Paul says, what? Know ye not ye shall judge the world? What? Know ye not ye shall judge angels? I'm going to be up here. I'm not going to be down here. That's taken care of. I'll be up here. You say, but you ought to be down there. Yeah, I should be, but I ain't going to be. <laughs> you say, haven't you broken that command? Yeah. Haven't you done that? Yeah. Haven't you done that? Yeah. Aren't you guilty? Yeah. Well, well how do you get up there? I took the cure. I took the cure. <laughs> I took the cure. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and beth him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Amen. Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's sing just as I am and thou wilt receive. Just as I am. You'll preach a message like this in a prison, you'll never get you'll never get less than ten of them say, sometimes twenty, sometimes thirty. I guess in a church the atmosphere is just different. Uh, maybe maybe it's everybody here tonight is saved. You don't no need why you should come, I don't know. But I know one thing for sure in churches these days, when you do get there and really get faced with the truth, the pressure is so great for you not to come that you probably won't make it if you want to come. Outside that door, there's just too much pressure. The wife and the kids and the mom and the daddy and the boss and the news media and stuff, the devil's got you. If I were you, I wouldn't let the devil whip me. I'd get to Christ. I'd go, I'd find somebody to get to Christ. I'd get to Christ if I had to climb over a bench to get to him. I don't worry about doing it. I'm not going to say we. I came to Christ the 14th of March, 1949. And what I've got was good for 50 years. Free. Well, you're going to beat that, man. You can't beat that. 50 years. Free. And then New Jerusalem on top of that. <laughs> like an old starving widow said one time about my gap when somebody gave her a loaf of bread. She said, she hugged her bosom and said, imagine all this and Jesus into the bargain. <laughs> we'll sing one more stand, we're going to close. I sing, just as I am, the first stanza, without one plea, and this is it. Whether you come or not, we're going to close. You've had time, you know what to do. You go out that door and you're saying, it's paid for or they're unpaid for, that's all there is to it. You got the payment or you don't. You don't have the payment, have a car wreck when you go home, you start paying. And you quit paying when God dies. And that'll be quite a while. Aren't just as I am. Without one plea. You're going to come, come on. You're going to come, come on. We're going to close. You don't come. 